So today I will talk to you about the introduction to exploring genome phenome data with uh, EJ. Uh, so today, um, the topics that I will cover are the introduction to EGA, what is in the EGA, how does EGA work, and I will talk to you about the three most common processes at EGA, that are how to submit data to EGA, how to request data, and for this part, I will mention how to search and how to apply for access to the EGA, and finally, how to download data from EGA. First, I would like to start talking a little bit about what is EGA. And EGA is the European Genome Phenome Archive. And the EGA is a long-term secure archiving. It's a resource for long-term secure archiving of potentially identifiable data. And this data is genetic, phenotypic, and clinical data that has been generated by biomedical research projects. So in this sense, the mission of the EGA is to foster host data reuse, to enable reproducibility, and to accelerate the translational research. Um, so EGA was launched in 2008 by EBI, and since 2012, we work in collaboration with CRG in Barcelona. So currently, EBI is a collaboration between CRG and EBI. So as you may know, Embol EBI has different archived services, and here are some examples of them. Uh, for example, ENA is for sequence data, array express for array data, and so on. But what makes EGA different? Well, the difference is that all these other archives are open um, public archives, and EGA is a control access archive. This means that EGA provides distribution for human derived data, which is sensitive uh, data, and for that reason, it cannot be openly accessible. But I will mention a little bit more what is the control access data. Well, normally, participants in medical or genetic research projects uh, have typically provide consent of their data to be used for research, but not to be opened to have public distribution. So for this reason, uh, this type of data needs a secure um, archiving, processing, and distribution service that respects this uh, initial consent that the participant gave that the data cannot be um, openly distributed. And that this is the reason why EGA was created as a service to make sure that this type of data can be made available for researchers who had been granted access in a secure and controlled way. So now that we have talked a little bit about what is EGA and why it was established, I want to tell you a little bit what is what you can find, find at EGA. Uh, EGA has grown quickly. Uh, currently, we are archiving around 4,500 studies from nearly 1,000 institutions that made up nearly 15 petabytes uh, of sensitive human data. And as you can see in these graphs, in the recent years, the data that has been deposited to EJ has increased importantly. And the data that you can find um, in EGA comes from different research fields. Mostly, uh, almost the 40% of the data comes from cancer research, but there is also data from rare diseases, infectious diseases, common and chronic diseases. And the this type of data is genomic data, phenotypic data, and clinical data that has been generated by different technologies, such as whole genome sequencing, sequencing, uh, bulk and single cell RNA um, sequencing, and DNA methylation sensitive sequencing. And all this data comes from studies from all around the world. And in this graph, you can see the different submitters at EGA. 
So as you can see, most submitters are from the United Kingdom, USA, Germany, China, Canada, France, Netherlands, Spain, Australia, Sweden, Japan, Finland, but EGA um, accepts a, um, data from all over the world. And for the data to be useful for others, it has to be fair. This means that has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And to improve this fairness on human research data, EGA services include the data submission, discovery, and access to the global research community. So in general, there are three main processes at EGA, and this is how EGA works. And the first process is the submit the submission of the data, the submission process. So this happens when a research group has generated a human data and they want to submit the data to EGA. The next process is the request process. And this is when a researcher uh, finds the data on the EGA and they are interested in this data and they want to have access to download this data. And for this process, the researcher who is interested in the data, they have to contact the DAC, that is the Data Access Committee, and tell them that they are interested in the, in the data, and then the DAC will evaluate their request and they will give um, granted access to the data. And finally, when the user has access granted, then they can download the data from the EGA, and this will be the download process. So now I will talk a little bit more about these uh, different processes. So the first process is the submission process uh, to submit data to the EGA. And EGA receives studies from different sizes and complexity, with match which makes the submitting data a very, a very specific process for each type of submission. But I will describe very generally uh, this submission process. So first, the submitter has to complete the submission form, and this form can be found in the, in the website. And then the submission form is sent to the help desk, and the help desk will start communication with the submitter, and we will share the TPA, that is the data process agreement with the submitter. The submitter has to sign and to agree with this uh, data process agreement. And then they have to send back this document to the help desk and we will um, set up a submitting account for the submitter and we will share the login details so they can connect to the submitter portal and they can start their process to submit data to the EGA. This data submit, uh, submitting this data processing agreement are the conditions and the responsibilities of the data processing. So it will establish the relationship between the data controller, that is the DAC, and the data processor, that is the EJ. So by, sign, by, sign, by signing this agreement, the data controllers can be ensured that the sensitive data is going to be handled accordingly to data protection regulations and security protect protections. So it, this will prevent that unauthorized, uh, uh, will, pre will, will prevent unauthorized access to their data. So as I mentioned before, the submission process is very specific for each type of submission, but as a summary, there are two main steps during the submission process. And the first one is to submit the raw or processed data. And the second one is to register the metadata. So for the first one, these raw or processed data are the set of files produced by the researchers from their experiments or data analysis. And these files have to be encrypted and the files are encrypted by tools offered by the EGA. And after the files are encrypted, they can be then uploaded to the EGA. And after the files have been submitted to the EGA, then the submitters have to register the metadata. And the metadata will be all the information describing the files that they have previously submitted to the EGA. It will be information about the study, the sample, how the data was generated and analyzed. 
and currently EGA offers a web-based interactive submitter portal where users can enter and organize their metadata manually. But for um, large scale or highly complex projects, EGA also provides an API to submit this data programmatically. But as I mentioned, this process is very specific for every submission, but if you are submitting data to EJ and you have any questions about this process, you can uh, send us an uh, email to the help desk and we will help you with your submission process. Next is the process of requesting data to the EJ. So let's start on how to search data on the EJ. So the main uh, entry point for data discovery will be the EGA website. And here I will do a live demonstration on how to search data on the EGA. So let's say that you are a researcher and you are interested in find data related to COVID. So the first thing that you have to do is to go, is to go to the, I'm trying to. OK, then the first thing that you have to do is to go to the website. Can you see the website now? Yes, yes we can see the website. OK, so then in the search option, you are going to type the thing that you are interested in. in this case will be COVID. And then you will find all the information related to COVID on the EGA. But in this case, we are going to go to studies. And here you can see the different studies that are at EGA. In this case, currently there are 26 studies. And then you will find the titles and you will find the one that uh, you are interested in. In this case, let's choose this one. And then you will find the, you will see the study page. And here you will find the study description. Here you will find more information about the study. You will see how the study was done, how the experiment and the protocol was done, how the files were generated. And after that, you will find the data sets that are associated with this uh, study. So here is important to mention that the studies IDs are EGA and then they are followed by an S. This means it's a study. And then for the data set is EGAD, and this means it's a data set. And after that, you will find all the publications that are associated with this uh, study. So now if we go here to the data set, we will find more information about this data set. Here, for example, we can see the technology that was used to produce this data set, the amount of samples, more information describing the data set. And if we click here in Browse Files, we can see all the files that are in this data set. In this case, there are 158 files. And we can also see the size of the data set, as well as the format of the files, the size of the files. And here we also find the IDs of the files. And in this case, because it's a file, the ID is EGAF for the file. So now if we go back to the dataset page, here we will find very important information and this is the DAC um, contact. So if you are interested on having access to this dataset in a specific, then you will have to send an email to this uh, DAC email uh, asking them to have access to the dataset and then they will share with you the data access agreement but i will talk a little bit about that uh, later and this is how you can find data um, on the ej website but now other example is when you find ej um, accession numbers in a publication so for example here is a um, publication and they mentioned that the exome sequencing data are deposited in the european genome gen Genome Phenome Archive, and they mention these different accession numbers. And here we can see it's an EGAS, so this means it's an study. So what you can do in this case is you can go to the EGA website again, 
and then you can copy the uh, EGA ID and then you can search for the EGA ID. In this case, because it was a study, we can select studies and then we find the study. And as well, we have the description, we have the data set that is associated to this study and the publications that are associated with the study. So if we click to the, you know, on the data set, here we'll find again more information about the data set. And if we go to broad files, we can see how many files this data set has, the size of the data set. And for example, this specific data set has some quality control reports, and this is a new functionality that EGI is implemented. So not, right now, not all data sets have it, but um, it will be implemented. And here you can see more information about the file to see if you are interested in request access to this data set. And again, if you go back to the data set page, you will find the information of the DAC, and then you will find the email where you can uh, send a request to have access to this data set. And now I will also like to mention the duo codes because EJ is now implementing these duo codes, which will allow to tag the data sets uh, with their use conditions, which can help the requesters to know what is required to ask for access to this data set. So, and these uh, duo codes will be uh, fine, you will find them in the uh, data set page. So if we go back to the dataset page, here we can see the duo codes, and these are like the specifications on how to use this dataset. So for example, um, this duo code is the project specific restriction. And if you want to know more about what this means, then you can click on this um, duo code link. And then here you will find the definition. So in this case, is this data use modifier indicates that the use is limited to use within an approved project. This means that when you request the data set, you specify for which project you use this, you will, you will be using this data. And in case you want to use this data for another project, then you have to apply again uh, for the access or you have to notify the DAC about this so they can approve the use of the data. So these two codes um, are very helpful for requesters to know what uh, is needed from them or, and how to uh, use the data. So now that you have identified which data you want to, to request access, I will tell to you how to apply for this access and what is the, the process um, to apply for the access. So first, I would like to mention what is ADAC. ADAC is a data access committee, and this is a body of one or more individuals who are responsible for data release to external requesters based on the data access agreement. And the data access agreement uh, is a specific for each DAC, each institution of each researchers that create their own data access agreement. And the DAC is typically formed, but not always necessarily, for the same organization that collected the data and they uh, generate the analysis. So in this case, the requesting process to have access to a data set that is archiving the EGA is that the requester needs to contact the DAC and request access. And then the DAC will share the data access agreement with them. And then after reviewing and approve the request, the DAC will notify the EGA help desk and we will create a download account for the requester. And as I mentioned before, the information um, to contact the DAC of the data set that you are interested is on the data set page. So after the DAC has informed us to open, uh, to create a download account for the requester, the requester ha will have access and then they can download the data from EJ. So now I will uh, talk to you about how to download the data from EGA. 
So after the EGA has created a download account for the requester, the requester will receive an email and the first thing they have to do is to set their EGA password. So when they receive the email, they will have a link where they can uh, set their password and then they have to wait about 24 hours for their account to be active. And then when the account is active, they can use the Python download client and this is how you can download uh, data from EJ. And all the information and the step-by-step -step, um, information about how to use this Python client is on the GitHub of the Python client. And also for the metadata, the metadata will be available on the EGA website. So after your account is active, you can log in to the EGA website and then you can go to the data set page and you will you will find this option where you can find the metadata and you can download the metadata from there. But now I will talk to you um, about the Python client. That is the tool that uh, we use at EGA for the requesters to download data. So the Py EGA tree is a download client, is a Python based tool for viewing and downloading files from authorized EGA datasets. And the Python client is compatible with any operation system and it requires a higher version of Python of 3.6. And it's a common client use only tool. And the three fundamental um, characteristics that the Python requirements that the Python client needs is connection to internet to have enough space on the destination where you are downloading the files and also to have an active EGA account or you can also use the EGA test account. And there are two ways on how to log in to log into the Python client and one is by the credential files or also there is an interactive command line session. So the first thing when you want to download the data is to install the Python client and the Python client can be installed by pip3 install pegi3 and then you can use this command line that is p this command that is pegi3h just to update your Python client. And after you have installed the Python client, then you have to create your credential files. That is how you are going to connect to the Python client. So in this case, I will show you how to um, install the Python client. Uh, in this case, I already have it installed in my computer, so it will just show us a message that is already installed on my computer. But now I will talk to you about how to um, how to uh, create the credential files to connect to the Python client. So in the GitHub, you will find a template um, on how to input your credentials. So then you can go to your uh, terminal and you can use a um, text editor to create the credentials file. And it's very important that the ext extension of the credential file is JSON because it's the way the Python client will recognize this file. And then we can uh, copy paste the template from the GitHub and here, the username, you have to change it for your um, email address that has the access and the password that you used. In this case, we are going to use the test account from EJ. And after this, we can save this document. And then we are going to have our credentials. And this is how uh, we are going to connect. But before that, I would like to mention a few things about the uh, the Python client. First are the identifiers. As I mentioned before, when we are referring to a data set, the ID will be EGAD. And when we are referring to a file, the, the ID will be EGAF. And here are some 
arguments that you can use with the Python client. For example, this dash CF is going to be to specify your credentials files. Then the dataset argument is to list all the authorized datasets that you have for your uh, email. And then the option files will be used to list all the files that are associated with one specific data set. Then the option fit will download either a data set or just a specific file. Also, the, uh, this argument dash C connection. And then the number of connections that we recommend is 20 connections and from there modify the number of connections until you get the maximum output. And this uh, option, the dash C, will um, help you to have a faster download and also a more stable download. And finally, this dash D is for debugging messages. So this one is very uh, useful when you are having some errors with the Python client and you want to report it to the help desk, it's very useful for us to understand why you are having the error if you add this argument when you are doing your download. So now I will show you how to use um, the Python client. So as you saw, we uh, already have our credential files here in this folder. So the way to connect um, will be using PEGA3. And then we are going to use the argument for the credential files. In this case, it's dash, dash CF and then the credential uh, file. And in this case, we are going to display the data sets that are uh, associated with our email. In this case, will be the EJ test account. So we run this, and then we will see the data sets that are authorized for um, this user. So here is some important information. Um, here we are using the last version of the Python client, that is 3.4.1, and this is very important because if you are not using the last version, then you can have some problems during the download. Also, here we are using uh, this version of Python. And as I mentioned before, uh, the, this Python client requires a version uh, higher than 3.6. And as well, you can see the user that we are using, that in this case is the EGA um, test account. So now that we can see the data sets, we are going to see the files that are associated with this specific data set. So in this case, we are going to do PEGA3, and then we are going to use again our credential file, and then we are going to use the option files to display the files in this data set. And here you will see all the data, all the files that are associated with that data set. And the information that will be displayed is the file ID, the size of the file, the checksum. And this information is important because it will help you to, to do a cross check after the download if for the integrity of the file and also the name of the files. So you can find maybe a specific file that you are interested and just download this specific file. So just for this example, let's download this uh, file. So the way to download the file will be to do PEGA3 uh, and then the credential files. And then we will use the argument fetch and the um, file ID and this will start the downloading of the file. So as you can see here, um, we are just downloading this file and here you will have some information about the available space that you have in your computer, which can be very helpful because sometimes the data sets can be uh, uh, two terabytes 
um, so it's important that you make sure you have enough space for your download. So hopefully this download will work because we've been experiencing some um, errors with the server lately. And also, also other important aspect when you display the files with, with the Python client is that at the end you can see the total size of the data set. So you can also um, know how much space do you need for the download. Well, in this case, it's taking some time to download, but I can show you how the output should look like. So this is how it will like after the download. So you will have um, that the download is complete, and then it will also display the MD file. So you can check um, with the list, when you list the files, if it's the same, so it will mean that the download was done correctly. This is not necessary. Um, just if there is a problem with the download, you will have an error saying that there is a mismatch on the MD files, but just for double uh, check, you can also check this information after the download. Yeah, so we are right now having some errors with the server, so that is why this uh, download cannot be done uh, currently. But I will show you other ways that you can connect to the Python client. So you can also connect by an interactive mode. So the way to connect by interactive mode is just is not to use the, if you don't want to use the gradation file, so you can just use the PA, P, by EGA tree, and then you just do, for example, data set, data sets. And then it will ask you to enter your username. In this case, it will be your authorized email. And we are going to use the test uh, account. So it's EGA test data at ebi.ac.uk. And then it will ask us for our password. So we input the password and then we can connect to the Python client and it will display the, um, the data the data sets. Um, in this case, for the test data for, for the test account is already hard coded into the Python client. So if you want to use this account, what you can do is to use PEGA3, and then you can use the, the argument uh, dash T, and this means you're using the test account, and then you can do data sets, and then it will display the data sets for the test account. And finally, I want you to show you how to use the debugging uh, argument and this will be helpful to report errors with the, the Python client. So you can do D and it will give you more information about the, the download. So for example, right now that there is some errors uh, with, the, with the server, maybe we can get more information when we use the, when we use the option uh, for debugging. So as you can see, it's giving us more information about the download.
but if not, when you are reporting the errors to EGA, you can go to the folder where you are downloading the file, and this uh, file will be created, this um, PEGI3 output log, and please um, share this file with us at EGA when you are uh, reporting an error, so it will be easier for us to identify the source of the error because if we display this file, you will see it will display like all the um, interaction that you've been having with the Python client. So this was a, a small demonstration on how to use the EGA uh, and the, how to use the Python client. And if you have any questions or if you have any, if you, encounter any errors where you see this uh, tool, please uh, contact us at the help desk and we will um, do our best to try to answer your questions.